We will start by acknowledging those that are at our Trothiata campus in Fairbanks are on unceded customary lands of the Dene people of the Tanana River. In Nome, we are on the Inupiaq, Yupik, and Siberian Yupik lands. We honor the continued fight for the rights of our first peoples and stand together in solidarity and action. At UAF, we are growing into a socially just and caring institution of higher education. This ongoing speaker series titled Shine a Light, promoting conversations on diversity, equity, and inclusion is designed to encourage understanding, build empathy, and engage us all in thinking critically about our worldviews. This series is led by UAF's Northwest Campus, but like great, all great diversity efforts, there are many partnerships and collaborations. We'd like to thank the UAF Department of Equity and Compliance for teaming up with our campus to bring this series to reality. So you can find the recordings of past presentations on our Northwest Campus website under the Outreach tab, and I can provide this link in the chat bar. This semester, our Shine a Light events are during the noon hour of each third Tuesday um, of the month. So again, thanks for being here, and we hope you continue to join us. So I'd like to introduce our um, speaker this month, JR and Cheta, for today's presentation on Ladawan making images. JR is a University of Alaska Fairbanks alumnus and is the chief storyteller for the UAF Geophysical Institute. Hear about his journey as a photographer and he'll share about his approach to the art and how his experience as an immigrant informs his work. JR Encheta is a photographer living in Fairbanks and he was born in Lawag City, Philippines and was raised in Sitka, Alaska after his family immigrated to the United States. So please use the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen for um, any questions that you may have that he can answer at the end of the presentation. You're more than welcome to use the chat feature, um, but please be sure and put your questions in the Q&A feature so we don't miss them. Okay, so at this time, I'll turn it over to you, JR. Great, thank you so much. Um, welcome everybody. And again, thank you to, um, for having me here today to talk about my journey as a photographer and my journey as a human being in this art that, so let me share my screen here and let's get started. So Ladawan making photos. I was born in the Philippines and immigrated to the US to Sitka with my mom and my siblings. Uh, my dad came later and I decided to name it Ladawan because Ladawan is actually my mother tongue, my is Ilocano, and Ladawan is the word for photos, photographs. And I think it's fitting um, because it's fitting because I think the root of Ladawan is Ladao, which is to be late or to uh, to be tardy, to to preserve. So it's appropriate. This is a picture that I made today here at the Trothiata campus at UAF. And I wanted to start off with a picture of my mom. Uh, she is an amazing woman. She lives in Sitka. And this was a few years ago when we, and when we were traveling um, to Hatcher's Pass and, sorry, I, I saw a raised hand. Um, and it's a wonderful picture of her. I asked her to jump and this illustrates my roots. My root is the Philippines. I'm Filipino American and I was born in the Philippines but also raised in Southeast Alaska. So I am Filipino and American. While growing up, that used to be a little bit of a conundrum, 
but now I see it as a, as a plus. And I embrace my culture. And while I was growing up in Southeast, um, there's sometimes growing up as an immigrant, one tries to shy away from your culture, to assimilate, to forget, to essentially be ashamed of where you're from, but now I embrace it. I also put this in there because this, it's not the first picture that I put, but this is a picture of the Eiffel Tower I took of my first trip to Europe, to Paris, with my 3.5 megapixel camera. I've made photographs before that, on point and shoot films, film cameras. But this one, as I was looking at older pictures, I really, oops, I really enjoyed. It was different at the beginning or at the moment, this was probably a horrible picture. But now, years and years later, I've appreciate it because it's different. And this also illustrates my journey as a person, as an immigrant. Again, I alluded to the fact that to be an immigrant growing up, there's the pressure of trying to forget or to assimilate, to change to the culture of where you're at currently. And I think this was a, this is a symbol of that. Because when I was in eighth grade, I needed to choose classes for my high school career. And I chose French over Spanish and partly because it was exotic and also little did I know that French language is actually very, very closely related to Spanish. I didn't want to study Spanish because of the history of Spanish in the Filipino culture. Uh, Spain colonized the Philippines um, year, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And there are so many roots in, of the Spanish language in Filipino language, in Ilocano and Tagalog. And so French seemed to be different. And we'll, we'll, I'll explain that later. So this series of photographs, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about um, Sitka. This is a series called Sitka Time and Tide. And Sitka is a very formative place for me. I chose to do a series on Sitka because is my home and it brought a great challenge for me as a photographer. It's a place that I've been years and years and I wanted to photograph it using a newly acquired camera, which is a Hasselblad. It's film, it's slow, methodical, and I wanted to capture the quiet moments of Sitka, my hometown. And I visited, this was when I was living in Alaska, or excuse me, Fairbanks. And I visited Sitka during summer vacation or during the winter holiday break. And I wanted to shoot black and white because most of the pictures I've, that I've seen growing up of Sitka are these colorful, bright, sunny days of Sitka. And 
it's never rainy. And I wanted to find these quiet moments of my hometown. And as you can see, half of these images are of landscapes and half with people in them. And I think this was a great exercise because now as a photographer, I am interested in the landscapes. I am interested in these quiet spaces without a trace of people. But now I am more curious of people and how they interact and how they work around their environment. And I think this series best illustrates that. And then after taking a, a break from studies, after living in France for a year and working, I decided to come to UAF as a student studying elementary education. And a class that I took really changed my path into photography. I had a camera. I was taking pictures at sporting events. I took a class, a basic digital photography class because I wanted to learn how to make pictures. And I attended numerous events. And finally, one lecture I attended was with Cheryl Hatch. I'm going to switch gears here a little bit. Because this is a very important part of my journey as a photographer. Cheryl is one of my mentors. She enjoyed speaking other languages, enjoys speaking other languages. She loved to tra she loves to travel. She was a photojournalist and she covered conflict in the Middle East, in Africa, and was the Sneden chair at the journalism department. She did a lecture on photojournalism and that lecture really inspired me to be a storyteller because I, was amazed at her images, her photographs. And I really was blown away by pictures that moved me, that told a story. And during her lecture, she mentioned that she spoke French. And I asked her a few questions in French. And right after I sat, I asked and sat in on her class for the rest of the semester. And we did a story together. We were interested in how, to, how soldiers prepared for going down range, going to Afghanistan. And we embedded with the 125th Striker Brigade here in Fairbanks at Fort Wainwright. And as a student, I created these images. I remember many conversations I've had with Cheryl about how do you how do you make these compelling images? How do you go on? And sometimes 
make really, really tough, poor pictures in situations. And something that she always mentioned was, JR, you are a human being first. And I think what I've learned from being, being around her and going to Afghanistan with her is the power of connecting to people, the power of being present and being observant and trying to capture the moment as it passes and anticipating the situation. And that this body of work from Afghanistan is really formative for me because it really taught me to have that connection, to see people where they're at and continue following the story. And we did. Cheryl and I embedded downrange in 2011, 2012. I remember talking to my other mentor, Charles Mason, who's a professor here at UAF. I remember going to his office in Benel and asking him or telling him, could I submit my final early? And this was to all my instructors as well. Could I submit my final early? Could I take my, my test early? I'm headed to Afghanistan to follow the story. Because the importance of this is I wanted, we wanted to see the story from start to finish. And so we did, we made it happen thanks to Major Maddox, um, who helped arrange the embed. And I'm going to go through these, these pretty quickly because we have a few to cover. But again, I think the most important is connecting. If I want to tell stories of people, I have to connect at their level where they're at, try not to make judgment, try to tell their story as best as I can. And it was a great experience. This is one of my favorite pictures or locations in Afghanistan. This is the MWR. Morale, welfare, welfare, and recreation. And this is the connection to back home. And I really, really enjoyed this space. You can see people on the computers and talking to on the phone towards home. And it was a special place for me. We were there during Christmas. And we were there before, but I was there for about a month. And Cheryl stayed for a little bit longer. And We participated in some air assaults where we loaded up on a C-7, excuse me, not C-17, a Chinook helicopter in the middle of the night, landed, rushed out of the, hel the helicopter in single file, got onto our knees and started walking.
But this is something that I wanted to, to do is to be with the locals. Unfortunately, we were embedded with the, with the military and so we didn't have as many interactions to the local population to Afghans in these communities. But these interactions were wonderful, so photographically, and, and I was curious to see how people lived in Afghanistan. Going back through these photos last year, I, I went and perused through these pictures last year. Um, it was kind of bittersweet. It was very bittersweet. I, I don't know what the word is. I don't think bittersweet is um, the right word. I think it was sad. I was sad to, to hear the news, the current events of Afghanistan. And I remember after my trip, I, I've always wanted to go back. And I hope that one day I will be able to go back and to travel and see Afghanistan again. I think this event was very formative for me or an important part of my journey because it really taught me to be a storyteller. It taught me to connect to people, figure out a way to see their story and document it. After I graduated here at UAF, I became the, I applied for a position as campus photographer and, and became the campus photographer. And I'm going to buzz through these pretty quickly because most of you might have seen my pictures already, you've seen them everywhere. But the experiences that I've taken over the years as I photograph people has always been the same. I try to meet people at their level. I try to connect. And I try to be curious to what they're doing, what they're studying, what, they, what makes them excited, what makes them sad, what, what makes them angry. I think it's that connection that I try to find in making these pictures. Oops. And looking at these images now, more of my photos are with people. Not just buildings, not just landscapes, but people, because I am curious to see what people are up to. And here's a body of work that I started as a student using a large format camera. 
large format camera is a big camera. It's about 40 pounds, the whole setup. And it's a, it has, this camera has to be mounted on a tripod. It can't be handheld. And this was my very first picture. It took about two hours to make. Luckily, my friend Nikki was late. Excuse me. And I set everything up. There are so many variables for this camera to fail. And luckily, my very first picture came through because of preparation, because of double checking, and a little bit about luck. This series photographs portraits around Fairbanks and trying to capture what um, life is like in interior Alaska using this camera. And it was a great exercise because it prepares me to what I'm currently doing today. Again, most of these images are during the summer. That's when I didn't have any class and or taken indoors because of the medium. It's taken on film and it's a very slow process. But this series really um, informed me how to use this medium. The next body of work I'm going to talk about is Une Chambre Noire à Paris. Why do I like this camera so much? Why, what, what is it? And I tell people the reason why I, I really enjoy this cam using this camera is that it is the friendliest camera ever, I think, personally. With digital picture, with digital cameras or smaller cameras, I always sometimes I feel that I'm grabbing. I'm just taking, or sometimes. I, there's a, 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 a hint of um, something nefarious happening when I'm out and about photographing something that I'm not uh, supposed to photograph. And one story I can share is that when I was giving a talk after my embed in Afghanistan. Uh, I was photographing on the street in Pennsylvania. Um, I was a lecture, not a lecturer, but I was a guest speaker at a conference, a photojournalism uh, conference. And as I was photographing in the street near Cher Cheryl's home, um, there was a cop that passes by and starts asking me questions. And so there's that side of photography as well. And I'm aware of it wherever I go as, as a photographer because of my um, background. So this camera, I, I wanted to challenge myself and I decided to take it to Paris to take it to carry the, the, this 40 pound uh, gear to the streets of Paris. I wanted to try the challenge to, to see what pictures I make of the City of Lights and came out with these wonderful images of Parisian life outside. And 
why I say it's the most friendly is because it's so obvious. It's such a big camera that people are curious. What are you photographing? What is that? Is it because the camera is made out of wood, leather, and brass? And so it was very friendly. And I really enjoyed photographing Paris with this camera. These street scenes taken on a very, very slow process with a camera that weighs a lot, but also I wanted to um, so the method of photographing with this camera was setting up the scene and then waiting until the moment happens because a picture taken with the with this a sheet of film, eight by 10 inches, cost about $5 to take. So each sheet is about $5. Now it's a little more than that because of inflation. But I could also take six maximum pictures with me at one time before I had to go back to where I'm staying, reload, and then go out again. And this is the, at the end of the series. And I put this in the last bit because photographs um, have this lasting impact, right? La da to, one, to, to linger, to be late, to preserve. And this was one picture I made of Notre Dame right before the roof of the cathedral burned. And I also wanted to sh show you other locations where I've taken this camera. This is in Fairbanks with my friend Bennett, who's a falconer. I took this camera to Point Hope. I think this is Kotzebue. And again, this is in Fairbanks during the Midnight Sun run. Uh, no, excuse me, Midnight Sun uh, baseball game. So that, let me check the time here. Plenty of time. So that leads us to what I am currently doing, which is wet plate collodion. It's a photographic process from the mid 1850s. So these are examples of collodion from the Library of Congress. Think Civil War era pic photography. These images are photographed on tin, on, on metal, or on glass. And it's a direct positive, it's a direct positive uh, process, meaning there's no negative. Each picture is unique and each picture is a one-off. Back in the day, copying it was unheard of. You had one picture and that's, that's it. You couldn't make copies. So here's a, a girl holding a, another tin type of a soldier. And these exposures were really long. So my mentor, Charles Mason, has been doing this for a while. And I've long said, this is not for me. It's dangerous. It's very finicky. It's not something that I, I'm, I, I like. I like film. Film is predictable. 
film is uh, dependable, easy in the sense that you make an exposure and it comes out every time. But with Collodion, things kind of get tricky because it's a slower process, slower speed than film and more finicky. But ever since I helped Charles producing a video, I was hooked and I'm still trying to figure out if this is where I want to continue or if this is something that I will say, maybe not for me after all. So collodion is basically a liquid Band-Aid that gets poured uh, on a plate. Then it goes to the dark room in the field dark room to be sensitized in uh, silver nitrate, which makes the plate uh, sensitive to light. And then we take a picture. And then once it's developed, it gets dipped into a fixer and it becomes an image. So here, I'm just going to buzz through these pretty quickly. And it has a different look. It's really slow, it's blurry. Um, it's interesting. It's more formal, even more formal than um, some of the other pictures that um, I've taken using the same camera with film. And most of these exposures are seconds long. And people have to sit for up to 30 seconds or more, depending on the light. And children become ghosts because they move. So as I conclude my, my talk, my photographs, and this is this is what I ask people all the time, or I ask my students, my my students, why photography? Why, why do we take pictures? And so I shouldn't have done that, I'm sorry. And the reason is it's that lasting effect. It's to document, it's to preserve, it's to um, reflect upon, it's to to excite people, to be excited about something, to lead people to action. Photographs are so powerful. And this is my family in Sitka. Um, and why photographs? I don't do this enough. And I encourage all of you to, to do so. But last year, my, um, my family lost my grandpa. And this is why photographs are so important because it's that lasting image of the people you love. And it's a, a history, a record. And I think it's very important to 
to make them. And that is why I also like to make pictures of people because it's important to be seen, to be remembered, and to be honored in a picture that may be here for a long, long, long time. And with that, um, I conclude my presentation. Thank you, JR. I just put in a chat that um, I lost my grandma last week, so that photograph was very touching. I'm sorry, Mariah. That's OK. Um, so we had a few questions and comments that came in through the chat feature. I didn't see any questions coming in through the Q&A, but feel free to, um, to, have it, to type any as I'm speaking. Um, so when do I use black and white and when do I use color? So for, for my personal work, I mostly use color. I mean, excuse me, black and white. And the, the reason why I choose to do that is sometimes to me, I think color could be distracting. Color is very important uh, commercially. It's very important to us as humans because it distinguishes a lot of things um, that um, are important to us. So why, why do we have, um, why are many, many, many things red in advertisement or on sides of buildings or you know, why is the stop sign red? And because it's very impactful. And when I get rid of color by choosing to photograph in black and white, th then it takes out that distraction and the viewer is able to tune in to the subject matter, to the textures, to the tones of the image. And I think that is why I choose to shoot in black and white. But I also choose to photograph in color too because that's what um, people like. Comment, photographs make us feel that we're back in the place. I respect that you can make us also feel like we're there. And that is also my goal as a storyteller is to give the viewer a chance to be there, to be present, to see what I see. And, and as a, an immigrant, as a person of color, it's so important to, to be seen, to be heard, to, to have that visual representation more so than ever, I think. Another question, do you think power who has it and who doesn't when you photograph certain places like Afghanistan? Um, so I think when I was in Afghanistan, power was, um, to me, it didn't f uh, feel that who the people who had or didn't have power, um, the soldiers, when the soldiers that we interacted with, um, when we went to the communities, um, were very cordial and respectful, and and I I didn't see that as much. Um, oh, there's more. Um, how old was I when I went to Sitka? I was nine years old when I moved, immigrated to Sitka, and. I um, I can still speak Ilocano, which is my mother tongue. Um, my when I 
um, I used to translate for, well, I still do. I translate for my family um, in, in many situations, um, especially with uh, medical questions. Um, Ilocano is not Tagalog, which is the um, Filipino language that is kind of what standard. And so growing up in a, a multilingual household, um, yeah, I, age nine was the perfect age, I think, um, because I wasn't too young to forget, but I wasn't, I was old enough to remember my experiences in the Philippines. Um, I still remember many things of the Philippines as a child, um, sight sounds. And actually before the pandemic happened, my family was going to the whole, my whole family, including my uh, aunt and uncle and their family in Sitka, we, we were going to the Philippines, but the pandemic hit. Um, but that's something that I, I want to continue to do is I want to take that big camera and go to the Philippines and, and make photographs of what I remember. Because now, as I'm getting older, the, these experiences that I remember are starting to be romanticized somewhat. And um, some things I'm forgetting and, and I, I want to relive that or go back and create images. For power and consent, um, what do you do with permission from people? I think it's important to get permission from people. Um, and in the journalism world, which I don't practice as much anymore, um, when making images, when people, um, I think there's always that permission. Um, there's that understanding. Um, there's that understanding of, uh, as a storyteller, I want to tell their story and Sometimes at the beginning, I, I, I won't even make a picture. And I try to connect with somebody first before taking the camera out. Because sometimes I think the camera can be a barrier to making that connection. And so it's important for me to know, assess the, the situation. And in a more public location, like being out in the streets, I tend to not do that as much. And that, that's one reason why I said that my, that big camera is a friendlier camera sometimes because I'm more obvious and I'm advertising that I'm there, I'm present. Whereas smaller cameras, sometimes you have that you know, grab um, making pictures of, of life that um, the collodion method tests patience. Yes, it is. It does. It certainly does. Do we have any other questions? We have just a comment in the chat about um, from Casey. I really appreciate that you're thinking about power and consent when it comes to photographing people. I've chatted with phot photographers who feel they're entitled to spaces and people just because they're in public. I think it's respect, to be honest. Um, and yeah, sometimes I feel um, 
awkward. I mean, um, a guilty. I'm not sure what that um, that uh, feeling is when um, I'm making pictures without somebody without somebody knowing. And sometimes I, I do it too. I'm guilty of that. I, I there's one picture that I showed you. Um, let me see if I could find it. It's the eight by ten picture of the couple. Where'd it go? This one. This picture of this couple, um, I did not ask for permission for this one. And I don't know their name. And, and that's the other thing that what happens is I, I want to know their names, um, but they left after I took the picture and it took me a while to make this picture. So um, my intentions were true and um okay well if that's all thank you everyone for joining us today um please keep an eye out for upcoming shine a light presentations at nwc.uaf.edu or facebook.com slash uaf.nwc. If you'd like to share the recording or give feedback, you can do so by giving or by visiting our outreach tab at nwc.uaf.edu. And this concludes our webinar. Thank you, JR. Any thank final you, Agil Manak. Thank you, thank you for having me and telling my story. And I'll go ahead and stop the recording.